This video may contain offensive language and be frightening to some viewers. Viewer discretion is recommended. The long road home seemed to go on and on. The road continued to outstretch in front of the vehicle endlessly. The light that shone through the branches of the tall green trees danced across the windows in random patterns, every once in a while obnoxiously shining in your eyes. The surrounding was full of deep green trees forming a forest around the road. The only sound was the sound of the car's engine as it travelled down the path. It was peaceful and let off a serene feeling. Although the ride seemed like a nice one, it lacked every form of nice for both passengers. The middle-aged woman behind the steering wheel had neat short brown hair that fit her complexion quite well. She wore a green v-neck t-shirt and a pair of blue jeans. Diamond stud earrings decorated each of her ears, which partially showed from behind her haircut. She had deep green eyes which were brought out by her shirt, and the lighting seemed to make them more noticeable. There wasn't much significant about her appearance. She just looked like any average mother that you would see on TV shows and such. But one thing for sure made her different from those average mothers, and that was the dark bags under her eyes. Her facial expression was gloomy and sad although she genuinely looked like someone who smiled a lot. She would sniff every once in a while, and occasionally glance back in the rearview mirror to look back at her son in the back seat, who was hunched over partially, his arms held tight around his chest, and his head pressed against the cold window. The boy lacked any normal appearance. Anyone could blandly see that something was... wrong with him. His messy brown hair went in every which way, and his pale, almost grey skin was brought out by the luminescent lighting. His eyes were dark, unlike his mother's, and he wore a light t-shirt and scrub pants that had been provided to him by the hospital. The clothes he had worn before were so shredded and bloodstained that they weren't wearable anymore. The right side of his face bared a few cuts along with his split eyebrow. His right arm was bandaged up all the way to his shoulder, which had been shredded when his right side had hit the shattered glass. His injuries appeared to be painful, when really he couldn't feel a thing. He never could feel a thing. That was one of the glories about being him. One of the many challenges he had to face growing up was growing up with the rare disease that caused him to be completely numb towards pain. Never before had he felt himself get hurt. He could have lost an arm and felt nothing. That and another major disorder he had faced was the one that deemed him many insulting nicknames. In the short time he had attended grade school, before he was moved to homeschooling, was his Tourette Syndrome, which caused him to tick and twitch in ways he couldn't control. He would crack his neck uncontrollably and twitch every once in a while. The kids would tease him and call him Ticky Toby and mock him with exaggerated twitching and laughing. It got so bad he turned to homeschooling. It was too hard for him to be in a common learning environment with seemingly every kid poking or more like stabbing fun at him. Toby stared blankly out the window. His face was empty of any depictable emotion, and every few minutes his shoulder, arm or foot would twitch. Every bump that the car tires hit made his stomach turn. Toby Rogers was the boy's name, and the last time Toby remembered riding in a car was when it crashed. That's all he thought about unconsciously replaying everything he had remembered before he blacked out, over and over again. Toby had been the lucky one, when his sister hadn't been so lucky. When the thought of his older sister came, he couldn't help but let his eyes begin to tear up. The horrible memories were played in his mind. Her screaming that had been cut off when the front of the car was smashed 
It all went blank for a moment before Toby opened his eyes to see his sister's body. Her forehead pierced with glass shards, her hips and legs were crushed under the force of the steering wheel. Her torso pushed in from the late inflated airbag. This was the last thing he had seen of his dear older sister. The road home continued on for what seemed like forever. It took so long to get home due to his mother wanting to avoid passing the site of the crash. When the surrounding gave in to a familiar neighbourhood, they had both been more than ready to get out of the car and step back into their own home. It was an older neighbourhood, with quaint little houses all next to each other. The car drove in front of a little blue house with white window panes. They both quickly noticed the old vehicle that was parked in front of the house and the familiar figure who stood out in the driveway. Toby felt automatic anger and frustration take over him at the sight of his father. His father who wasn't there. His mother pulled up the car into the driveway beside him before turning off the engine and preparing to step out and face her husband. Why is he here? Toby said quietly as he looked back at his mother who reached to open the car door. He's your father, Toby. He's here because he wants to see you. His mother responded in a monotone voice, trying to sound less shaky. Yet he couldn't have driven up to the hospital to see Lyra before she died. Toby narrowed his eyes out the window. He was drunk that night, honey. He couldn't drive. Yeah, when is he not? Toby pushed open the door before his mother and stumbled out onto the driveway, where he met his father's gaze before looking down at his feet with a stern expression. His mother stepped out behind him and met her husband's eyes before walking around the car. His father opened up his arms, expecting a hug from his wife. But she walked past him and put her arm around Toby's shoulder and influenced him to begin walking inside. Connie, her husband began to say under a raspy voice. What? No welcome home hug, huh? She ignored her husband's obnoxious words and walked past him with her son under her arm. Hey, he's 16, he can walk himself. His father began to follow them in. <sighs> he's 17. Connie glared back at him before opening the door to the house and stepping inside. Toby, why don't we get you in your room so you can rest, okay? I'll come get you when dinner is ready. Nah, I'm 16, I can walk my thief. Toby said sarcastically and glared back at his father before stumbling up the small staircase and turning into his room, where he slammed the door violently. His little room didn't have much in it, just a small bed, a dresser, a window, and his walls had a few framed pictures of his family, back when they were a family. Before his father became an alcoholic and acted violently towards the rest of his family, Toby remembered when he was arguing with his mother and he grabbed her by the hair and shoved her to the floor. And when Lyra tried to break it up, he pushed her and she hit her back on the corner of the kitchen counter. Toby could never forgive him for what he did to his mother and his sister. Never. Toby didn't care how much his father beat him down. He couldn't feel it anyway. What he did care about was how he intentionally hurt the only two people he cared about. And when he was waiting in the hospital, where his sister took her last few breaths, the only person who didn't rush there was his dad. Toby stood by the window and looked out onto the street. He could have sworn he saw things out of the corner of his eye, but quickly blamed it on the medication he had been put on. When dinner time had come around and his mother called up to him, Toby came down the stairs and hesitantly sat down at the table across from his father and in between his mother and an empty chair. It was quiet as his parents picked at their food, but Toby refused to eat. Instead, he just watched his dad with a blank stare. His mother caught on to his stare towards his father and elbowed him slightly. Toby looked over at her slightly and looked down at his uneaten food in which he didn't touch. 
Toby lay in bed. He pulled his covers over his head and stared at the window. He was tired, but there was no way to fall asleep. He couldn't. There was too much to think about. He had been debating on whether or not to follow his mother's instructions and forgive his father, or to continue holding a grudge with his boiling hatred. He heard his door creak open, and his mother padded into the room and sat on the bed next to him. She reached over and rubbed his back, which had been turned to her. I know it's hard, Toby. Trust me, I understand. But I promise you, it will get better, she said softly. When is he going to leave? Toby said with an innocent tone in his shaky voice. Connie let her gaze fall down to her feet. I don't know, honey. He's staying as far as I know, she replied. Toby didn't respond. He just continued to look forward at the wall, holding his damaged arm near his chest. After a few minutes of silence, his mother sighed, before she leaned over to kiss his cheek, and stood up and walked out of the room. Good night, she said as she closed the door. The hours passed slowly, and Toby couldn't quit tossing and turning. Every time he let his imagination take over, he heard the screeching of tyres, the screaming of his sister, and he would uncontrollably jerk in bed. He threw off his covers laying on his back, and pulled his pillow over his face and cried into it. He could feel his chest rise and fall as he let out each shaky breath as he cried. He could hear his own pitiful weeping. He would have been screaming and crying if he didn't press the pillow over his face. After a few seconds he threw the pillow off his face as well and sat up. Hunched over, holding his head and breathing roughly, tears streaming from his eyes. He couldn't help but cry. He tried to keep it in, but he couldn't help but whine and whimper as he sat there shaking. He inhaled before he stood up and walked around his bed to the window and peered out, taking deep breaths trying to calm down. He rubbed his eyes and looked out at the group of tall pine trees across the street. He stopped suddenly and his gaze slowly centred on something standing under the streetlight. He heard ringing in his ears, and he couldn't look away. The figure stood beside the streetlight, about two feet shorter than it, long arms draped at its sides as it stared up at him with non-existing eyes. The figure had no features whatsoever, no eyes, no mouth, no nose, yet it held Toby's hypnotised stare seemingly peering into his very being. The ringing in his ears grew louder and louder each second he stared before suddenly it all went blank. The next morning Toby woke in his bed. He felt different. He wasn't tired at all and when he consciously woke up he felt like he had been lying there awake for hours. He had no thoughts flowing through his mind. He sat up slowly and stumbled over to the wall, but when he stood up, he automatically felt dizzy. He stumbled to the doorway and walked down the stairs. His parents were sitting at the table. His father was in tune with the small TV that sat on the countertop, and his mother was reading the newspaper. She quickly looked over when she felt Toby's presence looming behind her. Well, good morning, sleepyhead. You've been sleeping forever. She greeted him with a hesitant smile. Toby slowly looked over at the clock and noticed it was 12.30pm. I made you breakfast, but it got cold. I was going to wake you up, but I felt you needed sleep. Her expression fell from happy to worried as her son resisted responding to her. Are you alright? Toby stumbled over and sat by his father. He felt as if he was on idle and had no control over his actions. He was seeing everything he did, but it didn't seem to register in his brain properly. He reached out to his father's arm, but his hand ended up getting slapped. His father turned to him abruptly and pushed his chair over with his foot. Don't touch me, boy! He yelled. His mother stood up. All right, knock it off. That is the last thing we need. The days went by and things continued on as they were. 
Connie spent most of her time cleaning up the house, and her rude husband spent most of his time ordering her around. It was just how it used to be before the crash. Toby never really left his room. He would sit there by his bed and tremble. His mind would wander, but his thoughts changed too fast to be remembered. He would pace around his small room like a caged animal, or stare out the window. The unhealthy cycle continued. Connie continued to be pushed around by her husband, being way too submissive to him, and Toby remained in his room. Before he could think twice, he would begin to chew on his hands, tearing the flesh from his fingers. He would gnaw his hands until they bled. When his mother walked in on him while he was doing so, she reacted horribly. She rushed him downstairs and grabbed the first aid kit, wrapping his hands in bandages. She demanded that he wouldn't leave her side from then. He isolated himself so much that he began to hate being around others. His memory grew glitchy as well. He'd start missing memory of minutes, hours, days, and so on. He would begin talking nonsense about things completely unrelated to conversations he would have. He'd go off about seeing things. Sharks in the sink as he washed the dishes. Hearing crickets in his pillows. And seeing ghosts outside his bedroom window. All the nonsense landed him in a counsellor's office. His mother grew too anxious about his mental health. She decided it would be good for him to talk to a professional about what he was feeling. Connie walked Toby into the building, holding his hand and guiding him in. She walked him up to the front desk and began talking to the lady who sat behind it. Mrs. Rogers? The lady asked. Yes, that's me, Connie nodded. We're here to see Dr. Oliver. I'm here with Toby Rogers. Yes, right this way. The lady stood up and led them down a long hallway. Toby looked at the framed artwork down the halls and tuned into the sound of the lady's high heels on the hardwood floor. She opened the door to a room with a table and two chairs. If we can get him to sit in here for a few minutes, I'll get the doctor. She smiled and held the door open. Toby stumbled into the room and sat down at the table. He looked over at his mother and the lady before the door slowly shut behind them. He looked around the room before he held up his tightly bandaged hands and began to bite at them, in an attempt to unwrap his hands, but was interrupted as the door swung open and a young woman in a black and white spotted dress stepped in. She had light blonde hair and was holding a clipboard and a pen. Toby? She asked with a smile. Toby looked up at her and nodded. Nice to meet you, Toby. My name is Dr. Oliver. She put her hand out for him to shake, but hesitantly pulled away when she noticed his bandaged hands. Oh. She smiled nervously before clearing her throat and sitting in the chair across the table from him. So I'm going to ask you a few questions. Try and answer them as honestly as possible, okay? She placed her clipboard down on the table. Toby nodded slowly and held his restrained hands in his lap. How old are you, Toby? Seventeen. He responded quietly. She wrote that down on the paper that was clipped to the clipboard. What is your full name? T Toby Aaron Rogers. What is your birthday? April 28th. Who is your immediate family? Toby paused for a minute before answering her question. My mum, my dad, and... He stopped. M my sister. I heard about your sister, dear. I'm really sorry. Her expression faded into a sad, pity-filled look. Toby nodded. Do you remember anything from the crash, Toby? Toby looked away from her. His mind went blank for a moment. He looked down at his lap, and in the surrounding he heard a faint ringing sound. His eyes widened, and he froze in his place. Toby? The counsellor asked. Toby, are you listening? 
Toby felt a shiver go down his spine until he froze once again and slowly looked over out the little window through the door where he saw it. A dark featureless figure peering in at him. He stared, eyes widening, the ringing growing louder and louder until suddenly the loud voice of the counsellor broke his trance. Toby! she yelled. Toby jumped and fell sideways out of his chair, and backed up into the corner. Dr. Oliver stood up, holding her clipboard to her chest, a surprised look in her eyes. Toby met her eyes again, his breath hitching as he twitched. That night, Toby lay in bed, his eyes dazed as he stared straight up at his ceiling. He could feel himself begin to doze off when he heard the scattering of footsteps down his hallway. He sat up and looked towards the doorway, his door wide open. There was no light. Everything was lit by the luminescent blue glow of the moon through his window, leaving a cold lighting. He stood up and slowly made his way towards the doorway, when suddenly the door, which was previously wide open, slammed in his face. He gasped and fell back. He was out of breath when he hit the ground, and he began breathing heavily, his eyes wide open. He waited for a few seconds before getting back up on his feet. He reached out and grasped the cold door handle with his bandaged hand, and creaked it open. He looked out into the dark hallway and tiptoed out of his room. The window at the end of the hallway lit up the darkness with blue moonlight as he padded his way down. He could hear footsteps rustling around him, and faint giggling mixed with the pitter-patter of small feet. It sounded like a child had run in front of him, giggling and laughing in the dark. The hallway was a lot longer than he had remembered. It seemed endless, like the ride home from the hospital. He heard a door creak in front of him. M Mom? He called out in a shaky voice. Suddenly a door slammed behind him and he jumped and turned around. He heard a long eerie groan from behind him that seemed to croak right in his ear. He turned around as fast as he could and suddenly he was face to face with none other than his dead sister. Her eyes were clouded white, her skin pale, and the right side of her jaw only dangling on by tissue and muscle glass protruding from her forehead and black blood leaking down her face. Her blonde hair pulled back in a ponytail, as it always was, wearing her grey t-shirt and athlete shorts, which were dirty and spotted with blood. Her legs were bent in ways which they shouldn't be. She stood emitting a long croaking noise only an inch away from Toby's face. Toby yelped and fell back. Ah! He started to crawl backwards away from her, not able to break eye contact. He held with her blank, dead eyes. He dragged himself backwards until he backed up into something. He stopped for a second. Everything was dead silent, except for his heavy breathing and crying. He slowly looked up to meet the blank face of a tall, dark figure that stood over him. Behind the tall, dark mass were rows of children, looking to range from three to ten years, their eyes completely black, and dark blood leaked from their eye sockets. He screamed and stood up as fast as he could, only to be tripped by dark black tendrils that wrapped around his ankle. He fell straight onto his stomach and got the wind knocked out of his chest. He tried to scream out, but he couldn't make a sound. He wheezed out before it all went black. Toby woke up with a start. He screamed out and sat up as fast as he could, completely short of breath. He wheezed out and felt his chest with his bandaged hands. It was just a dream. Just a dream. He laid back down in his bed and rolled over on his side. It felt like a giant weight had been lifted off his chest as he took in deep breaths. He stood up and padded over to his window. He saw nothing. 
Nobody was out there. No ghosts, no figures, nothing. He heard the rustling and coughing of his father out the doorway. His door was closed. He walked over and opened it, looking out into the hallway once again. He padded down the hallway and into the kitchen where he found his dad standing and having a smoke in their living room. Toby waited a second and watched him from around the corner before a burning feeling started deep in his chest. Deep, boiling anger took over him. He heard the little imaginary voices in his head. Do it. Do it. Do it, they chanted. He turned away and held his arms. He felt like he actually had control over himself, unlike he did for the past few weeks since he got home from the hospital. He actually had complete thoughts, where just moments before, they were clouded by the chanting of the little voices in his head. Kill him. He wasn't there. He wasn't there. Kill him. Kill him. They continued on. Toby trembled. No. No, he wasn't going to do it. What? Was he going crazy? No. He won't kill anyone. He can't. He hated his father, but he wasn't going to kill him. That was it. The last thought he had before he fell into an idle state once again. The influence of the voices in his head was too much. He began to silently walk up behind his father. He reached over the counter to the knife holder in the kitchen and pulled out the largest knife that had been resting in a case. He gripped it in his hand. He felt a sensation take over his chest. He let out a snicker. <laughs> he began laughing so hard he had to gasp for breath. His father turned around abruptly before he felt a brute force shove him to the floor. He grunted as the air was knocked out of him. What? He looked up at the boy who stood over him, grasping the kitchen knife in his hand. Toby, what are you doing? He went to sit up and put his arms out in front of him in self-defense. But before he knew it, Toby was on top of him. He went to grab at his neck, but his father reached out and blocked his hand by grabbing onto his wrist. Stop! Get off me, you little fucker! He yelled and with his other hand threw an off-center punch towards Toby's shoulder, but he didn't stop. The look in Toby's eyes was not sane. It looked as if a demon had taken control over him. He yelled back and went to stab the knife into his father's chest, but he blocked him and grabbed onto his wrist once again. He went to shove him back, but Toby kicked out with his feet in front of him and landed a hard blow straight to his face. His father recoiled and pulled his arms away to cuff his face, but Toby got back up and drove the knife straight into his shoulder. His father let out a loud cry and went to pull the knife out, but before he could, Toby threw his fist straight into his face. He began to pound his fists into his head, laughing and wheezing. He cracked his neck and grabbed the knife and ripped it out of his shoulder. He drove it deep into his dad's chest and repeatedly stabbed into his torso blood spilling out and getting splattered everywhere. He didn't stop until his father's body went still. He threw the knife over to the side and leaned over his body, coughing and panting. He stared at his smashed in face and sat there twitching, until a loud scream broke the silence. He looked over to see his mother standing a few feet away, covering her mouth, tears running down her face. Toby! Why did you do that? She cried. Why? Toby stood up and began to back away from his father's bloody corpse. He began to back out of the kitchen. He looked down at the blood-soaked bandages on his hands and looked up at his mother one last time before he turned and ran out the house. He ran into the garage and slammed his hand against the control panel on the wall, opening the garage door. Before he ran out, he saw his father's two hatchets that had been hanging on a tool rack above a table full of jars, filled to the brim with rusty nails and screws. One hatchet was new. It had a bright orange handle and a shiny blade. The other was old, with a wooden handle and a dull blade. He grabbed both 
and looked down at the table. His eyes met a box of matches, and under the table was a red gasoline tank. He held both of the hatchets in one hand and grabbed the matches and gasoline before running out of the garage, down the driveway and up the street. As he approached the streetlight that he could see out of his own bedroom window, he heard police sirens in the distance. He turned around and the red and blue flashing lights came rushing down the street. Toby stood for a second before he pulled open the cap to the gasoline tank and ran down the street spilling gasoline everywhere. When the tank was nearly empty, he turned to run into the trees. He poured the last bit of gasoline out, and then reached into his pocket and pulled out a match. He struck it against the box and immediately dropped it. In an instant, flames burst out around him. The fire caught onto the trees and the bushes around him, and before he knew it, he was surrounded by fire. The silhouettes of police cars were visible through the flames as he backed away into the forest around him. He looked around but his vision was blurred. His heart was pounding and he closed his eyes for a moment. That was it. This was the end. Toby felt a hand on his shoulder. He opened his eyes and looked over to see a large white hand with bony fingers that was resting on his shoulder. He followed the arm that was attached to the hand up to a towering dark figure. It appeared to be wearing a dark black suit, and its face was completely blank. It towered over Toby's small frame and looked down on him. Tendrils reached out from its back. Before Toby knew it, his vision was blurred and he was surrounded by the sound of ringing in his ears. Everything went blank. That was it. That was the end. That was how Toby Rogers died. A few weeks later, Connie sat in her sister's kitchen. Her sister Laurie sat next to her, drinking a cup of coffee. About three weeks ago, Connie lost her husband and her son, and a few weeks before, she lost her daughter in a car crash. Since then, she moved in with her sister. The police were keeping her busy. They had just finished cleaning up the case, and the story had been released two weeks ago. The focus of the world seemed to have shifted to completely new issues. Laurie switched on the TV to a news broadcast. On the TV, the news reporter began introducing the new headline. We have breaking news. Last night there has been a reported murder of four individuals. There are no suspects yet, but the victims were a group of middle school kids who had been out in the woods late last night. The kids had been bludgeoned and stabbed to death. The investigators have discovered a weapon at the crime scene, which appears to be an old dull-bladed hatchet, as you can see here. The picture changed to show snapshots of the weapon exactly as it was left on the crime scene. Investigators had pulled up the name of a possible suspect, Toby Rogers, a 17-year-old boy who a few weeks ago stabbed his father to death and tried to cover up his escape by setting a fire in the streets and the forest area around the neighbourhood. Although they had believed the young boy had died in the fire, investigators suspect that Toby Rogers may still be alive due to the fact his body was never found. And suddenly the lights shot on. The intensity of the lights was practically blinding. All I could see was a small dark silhouette slowly shuffling towards me. Then another one appeared. And another. And another. There were dozens of them all coming towards me. I couldn't move, my legs were frozen. All I could do was watch as the haunting figures drew nearer. 